Hey, welcome back to Divinely Uninspired, episode 19. It's good to be together again here, as always, with Jeremy, our fearless leader. Hey, how's everybody doing? Good. You you have something going on this weekend? Do I? Oh, yeah. I'm running a race. Yeah. yeah I'm running. The, it'll be my 21st mini marathon. How are you feeling about it? Uh, okay. I'm at the point now. I haven't trained very well, so I mean, I'll finish, but yeah. Yeah. No, oh, it's better. It's than- just a fun race. Why the mini? Like you don't want to try for the marathon? I've ran three marathons and I will never do another one again. Mm. They're pretty brutal. And that voice you just heard was Penny with us today. Hey, Penny, how are you? Hey, y'all. I'm doing fine. And joining us, very special guest today, Paul Routen. Paul, how are you? I'm doing good. How well, are you? Yeah. Good. Glad yeah. you're here with us. <laughs> This is Paul's first time. Yeah. He's the the magic uh, maker of all of our video and and photos. And if you watch on Sunday mornings, all the camera cuts, that's all Paul. So April couldn't be with us today. So we thought, hey, let's invite Paul in. He's funny. So <laughs> I'm funny like April or I'm funny? What? No, like actual funny. Hey, okay. can you move the mic closer to your mouth? Sorry. That's okay. It's it. it it's it's a terrible mic stand. It is. Sorry. It's terrible. I need to invest in another one. So, but anyway, uh, we got a lot to talk about today. But first thing first, here's a song. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. You're listening to Divinely Uninspired, a podcast by Journey Church Shepherdsville, hosted by Jeremy Willis and me, Rusty Wilson. You can find us online at journeyshepherdsville.com. For questions or comments, email podcast at journeyshepherdsville.com. Maybe we'll feature your question or comment on a future episode. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about today is very, very, very important. And it's especially important for me and Jeremy um, because... I don't know if anybody else saw the news. I, I you kind of can't miss it at this point in time, but Elon Musk has purchased Twitter for forty four billion dollars, and I'm a I, I am an avid Twitterer. I don't I don't know what the you tweet you know, Twitter. Well, no, I'm an avid Twitter, but I don't ever tweet anything. Well, I don't I just I, get on. Well, like, that's what I mean. Yeah, I've probably tweeted ten things. I've been on it from almost since the beginning. Yeah, I don't tweet. I re, I retweet every once in a while, but it's got to be something really special for me to retweet it. But I, I live on Twitter. I hardly ever get on Facebook, yeah. but I'm on Twitter all the time. I myself have only twatted a few times. Is that yeah. the past tense for, for tweeting? Can yeah. I say that? I'm, I'm leaving but it no. in. Um, yeah. So I I am concerned. So I think that uh, Twitter might be dead to me. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to give it. I, who knows if anything's really going to change? That's true. I mean, I, I'm not going to. I won't jump the gun too soon. But. I'm confused. Like, what do you think is going to change? So the nice thing about Twitter is that it, they actually had some moderators who, if there are people using hate speech and things like that, they shut it down. Elon Musk has been pretty vocal that like, nope, this is our public square uh, for the world now. And people should be able to say whatever they want, regardless of the consequences. So, so it's going to be like that. What was that chain eight or chain? Nine? Remember that whole documentary about um, it was on HBO. We've talked about it before. 4chan. 4chan. Yeah, yeah. 4chan. It's going to yeah. be like that, only more public because people can put whatever they want. I am concerned about that, but I'll just block those people. That's yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I've, I've already, I'm already looking into alternatives. There's a, a, popular one that uh, they had to redo their entire infrastructure because they've had such a large influx called counter social. So if you're looking for uh, an alternative, but the problem Twitter, with that is nobody's on that. So I get on Twitter to see what people are saying. I know. Well, so, the, the thought is that a lot of people are migrating over there. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not happy about the whole situation, but who, Jack, Jack Dorsey, the owner of Twitter, well, previous owner of Twitter, he says he thinks this is the right move, but $44 billion. Well, $44 billion. Yeah. That's a it, pretty good move. I, yeah. I, it probably is the right move. So now, you, now whose thoughts were that people are moving to counter counter social. social yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, a lot of people on Twitter have said, Hey, I'm registered over here under the same handle. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see. I don't, I don't know. Is, I'm, it, is it just you, Rusty, that's moving over there? Because I've, I've never, never heard, heard of it. this before. Yeah, well, I hadn't heard of it either. And uh, a comedian I follow by the name of Yvette Nicole Brown. She's funny. She was on Community. She she turned me on to it. So, so you and Yvette are just going to move over. Yeah, me and Yvette. And uh, I, I really hope Yvette hears this because I'm a big fan of hers and would love to have her that would be show. funny if it was just you and her yeah it would be <laughs> you're just you're hey, retweeting I, her tweets i would be i would be okay with that i would join it gladly thank you okay thank you paul so there's me yvette and paul and paul can do all of the video for us 
All right. Well, yeah, let's talk about something a little bit more important than Twitter. Um, not much, but a little bit. So a, a report came out uh, with Christianity Today. Christianity Today. That is a hard thing to say fast. Um, they they should probably change the name of that. They do. They just call it CT now. Oh, well, That's, I feel like I've been missing out. Yeah. So, so like when you get the magazine, because I get it, it's just CT on it. The name well, is like Christianity Today on it anymore. Oh, okay. Well, a new report came out by <laughs> CT uh, that, um, 26 million Christians stopped regularly reading their Bibles during the pandemic, 26 million. And, and that is, uh, I would imagine that that's Americans. It didn't specifically. Yeah. Say. Cause it's by the American Bible society. Yeah. So, so yeah. that makes sense. So 26 million Americans stopped reading the Bible regularly during COVID-19. I have to say, I'm kind of shocked that there were 26 million Americans reading regularly anyway. Well, if you read the article, this is this article, like it is fascinating to talk about because I think we have a good discussion about it. But when you read the article, there's one line that says, in 2021, about 50% of Americans said they read the Bible regularly, which is three or four times per year. So regularly now is three or four times per year. So three or four times per year, you accidentally read the Bible. According to them, you are reading the Bible. It's probably taken into context to you're talking about reading the Bible at church, like the three to four times they go during church. Sure. Or I don't know. It's it's there's something wrong here. Like how are they even basing this upon? How how do you get that stat? Are people just writing in and saying we've stopped? Well, I I think they probably did a a poll, um, but uh, but. No, I mean, I, I have to admit, I don't read the Bible. I mean, I read it more than three or four times a year, but I... <laughs> Fresh, this is going to be a prayer thing all over it, again. It is. I don't <laughs> read the Bible. You pray. No, I don't read the Bible at all. I, I read... The, I read uh, come, come enjoy your Rusty's Revelation glass. <laughs> that's right. From someone that's never read the Bible. <laughs> that's right. It, 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 here's, a, here's the end. It all burns. Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, but maybe it does. So currently, only 10% of Americans report daily Bible reading. That tracks for me. Yeah, 10, that does. The 10% doing daily Bible Bible readings. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I, I wish I did. I wish I could admit that I did daily Bible readings, but I, I, I don't, I get so busy and and that is shameful, I guess. I don't know. Should I be ashamed of that, Jeremy? Um, I have it. Well, yeah, you should. Um, no, I have a daily notification reminder that reminds me I can set it up on the Bible app, but honestly, if I didn't get that daily notification reminder, I don't know if I'd do it every day, but mm-hmm. I have it like you can set it to where every day. So at eight 30 in the morning, I get a notification to read my Bible um, but it like links, like it's the app pops up and I just click on it and it gives me my, like my daily verse oh, or whatever. I like that. Um, oh, but is it you just can also, one verse? Well, no. So the, I'm doing a, I do different studies. Like there's different studies on there. So, um, you could do the verse of the day. You can just get the verse of the day pop up on your screen or you can like link to your like little study you're doing. And so I do that. But honestly, if I didn't get that 830 reminder every morning, I don't know if I would do it. Cause I was, I was bad. I mean, I read the Bible a lot because of my job. Sure. But a lot of times my Bible reading was cause I have to preach a sermon. So I've got to read the Bible to get verses for the sermon, you know? Um, See, if but Jeremy no, let me really preach helpful. more, I'd be reading the Bible more. It's really you, you can preach fault. this week. No, I, don't, I don't want to. <laughs> okay. No, you don't do the announcements. You can't preach. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, that's right. You got it. Man. You, you got this weekend. Um, so yeah, so I, I don't, that doesn't, I don't know. That doesn't surprise me 10%. And I think that, I think a lot of people, so the, what is the Bible class? And you'll probably experience this in the what's revelation class. Um, Bible um, literacy is very low amongst people. Um, and, and I think that that is part of it. They don't understand what the Bible is. The other thing is I think so many people treat the Bible. And I talk about this in the what is class. That this is actually the wrong way as a devotional book. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if everything, so a couple of things could happen. If you're only treating it as a devotional book, you're looking for these positive verses and you read something and it doesn't go well, then you're like, well, that didn't work, you know, or that type of thing. So I think that's a big thing that is misunderstanding what the Bible actually is and how useful it actually is and the story it's trying to tell. So I think that's why people, I think people think the Bible is irrelevant because they've been taught, you know, a bad version of it. Yeah. Penny, how often do you read the Bible? Let's just, let's just all put our cards on the table. I know. I think we need to be very honest here. I do not read it every day. Um, I have different ways of learning from things. Like we have the Bible project it's a podcast. Um, it does discuss like Bible stories and breaks them down for you. Um, is would that really be considered like Bible study? Well, I think that's a good point, actually, that this doesn't take into consideration is between podcasts and I mean like sermons. Like, I mean, I know that I probably watch more sermons or listen to more sermons than the average person to get ideas and stuff, but a lot of people probably do. They, you know, on their drive to work, they listen to some a podcast and and so like, you don't necessarily, I mean, it sounds bad. You don't necessarily need to read the Bible anymore to know what's in the Bible. 
You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I don't, I know I'm saying we shouldn't read the Bible, but I do think that's a good point is people listening to podcasts or sermons or whatever. I mean, we've made it so accessible to access this information um, that you may not have to every day open up your Bible to feel like you're connected to God or whatever. What about you, Paul? How often do you read the Bible? More than once a quarter, but not daily. Got it. I think I'm going to do a verse of the day on counter social. That seems like a Ooh, yeah. good way to jump yes. into that. And then Yvette everybody Nic- can- Yvette social. Nicole. Br- Yvette. Well, I mean, I do. Yvette, she's a Christian. I, do, I probably do. So on Twitter, I follow a lot of guys that quote like daily Bible verses and like there's a daily Keller thing and all that stuff I follow. Does so. that count? And what does Jeremy think? Yeah, maybe. For the Bible reading? Yeah. I see it on Facebook. This is not the official what does Jeremy think. We'll do yeah, that, that later. That was a bonus. I So I do like the idea though of listening to the Bible be be read, but I want it read by interesting people, not just like, you know, some guy. I, I like. I want the Bible read by Jeff Goldblum. Well, there's a dwell. Have you heard of dwell? Yes. So dwell, I, I didn't like it at first, but then, this is going to sound really weird. There's this one that I really like where it's this guy, he's from Africa and he's got like this deep African voice and he like reads the Psalms and when it, he kind of almost has like a James Earl Jones kind of uh-huh. sound. So I really do like that. But yeah. they'll read the Bible verses too. Is there not an audio book of James Earl Jones reading the Bible? I, I bet there, there is. Oh, I'm sure there is. I see it on Facebook. Sure. Yeah. But I, I still think, you know, Jeff Goldblum, Jerry Seinfeld, one of them. Jerry Seinfeld would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah He's the Jewish. Beginning. Yeah. He's Jewish. He'd read the Old Testament. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh, Shema, hero, Lord, whatever. <laughs> uh, okay. So we need to read the Bible more. I guess that's the headline here. Um, the number before the pandemic of daily reading was about 14%. So 4% I don't just seems off there. really strange, right? Because during the pandemic, people were coming up with their own things of why the pandemic is there and it's biblical based. So somebody at home was reading the Bible yeah. to, to say what was going on yeah, during the COVID. Wor- the world didn't end, so they stopped reading it. That's right. This it was is all true. Like prophecy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Is they it were- 14 million people or 14 million Christians that are? Uh, it, well, it was 14%. Uh, it, I would imagine that that's just Americans. It, it doesn't delineate. Right. So, I, But I would guess that you, probably the vast majority of that percentage is... But that's actually a good point. So Christian if you're people. saying what, so last year the study was 48% of Americans claim to be Christians. Mm-hmm. So if you do, the, so if you start breaking it down mathematically, it's actually a higher percentage of Christians that are reading the Bible. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like if it's doing the all of America... That's one thing, but why would 52% of Americans that aren't Christians be reading the Bible anyway? So there's flaws in this poll. Something yeah. it's, add up. it's still a good t- discussion, mm. and everybody should read their Bible more. We should. We should. Go on the Bible app, set a daily reminder like me, and there you go. I'm going to look into the most interesting audible versions of the Bible being read to you. And if there's not one, then I will create one of various impressions of people. What if there's like Klingon, like for this Trekkies? Oh, out there? I'm sure there somebody <laughs> has, has done that. You know, I, I still, I just want somebody with an interesting voice. If I'm going to listen to him, I want to listen to him be interesting. Just, what about, what just, about Owen Wilson? Does he, what about who? Owen Wilson? Does he, Wow. Yeah. Oh, gosh. The For, worst people. Wow. Forgot so love the world. Wow. What, if, what if there was like a Christian Bell doing the Batman voice one? I know what, you're a big Batman guy. The, the, so yeah, you can't really understand anything. Either. <laughs> but that's 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 what we're going to do. We're just going to do a collection of impressions. Uh, uh, God uh, uh, so loved the, the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, boy. You know, just <laughs> it would take like three hundred uh, hours. It, it to would, get but through, it's just like... going to be several people doing one verse, so <laughs> a, a, a different individual for every verse. So, wow, I did all the Owen Wilson <laughs> says just every time he reads a verse. Okay, let's talk about wokeness because it's apparently a big problem in our world today. And uh, there's a college in Pennsylvania called Grove City College. And on uh, Religion News Service, they they posted this article about Grove City College rejects, quote, wokeness and CRT, that's critical race theory, uh, in a new report. So here's the story. So in 2020, they invited Jamar Tisby, who is a historian, a writer. Um, he's a, a, a black man who wrote a a very popular, famous book called The Color of Compromise, trying to kind of detailing the history of where we have been in this country with race. And um, he was invited to speak in 2019, uh, but because of some scheduling stuff and COVID hitting, uh, he got pushed to 2020. Now, they uh, gave him a standing ovation at the chapel speaking. You watch it online, and and, um, it's it's a perfectly fine talk. I I like Jamar Tisby. Um, 
But afterwards, uh, there was a bit of a, a, an uproar among a certain su- number of students, alumni, parents who were upset because they said that he speaking at the school uh, promoted CRT concepts. And, uh, and so the school put together the first time ever in their history a, a investigation into this issue. And they said, well, we as a college have not become woke, uh, but we did make a mistake when we invited Jamar Tisby to, to speak because um, he has uh, promoted in his books, which he has not, these, these books that they're claiming uh, were published after he spoke, um, progressive political concepts. Mm. And so because of this, uh, they, they denounced uh, his, his chapel appearance and claimed it was a mistake. So um, Jamar Tisby has come out and said, you know, this is absolutely not the case. And actually, if you read any of his stuff, he does not, he, he CRT, which is, we're going to talk about that in a second. Just it's a boogeyman term, which people don't even know what that means. Um, but they're, they're criticizing him as being quote unquote woke. And we're just going to talk about that a little bit. Like, so this college, whatever they, they do, you know, that, that's, that's their business. But this idea of like Christianity or Christians or Christendom, whatever you want to call it, fighting against this idea of being woke or wokeness. Um, I don't know. I want to hear your guys' thoughts and your opinions. Is, is this like actually something to talk about or is this just the new boogeyman? Is this the, well, if you're not, you're, you're a communist if you don't, you know, agree with me type thing. I don't know. What's your thoughts? I, so my thing with being woke is I don't really understand it. Yeah, you need to define it. Yeah, I mean, because even CRT, like I've read a lot about CRT and I don't want to get too much in CRT because it could be such a controversial subject that honestly, I, don't, I mean, I've read some of the, the papers and stuff like that. And, you know, there's so many things classified under it that aren't really that. And it, there's just there's a race problem in America. We can just go ahead and, and it's been since the beginning. But the wokeness thing, like, I feel like I don't understand and then actually I watched a really good show and I only watched it because uh, Winston from the new girl is, was in yeah. it on Hulu called woke. And it was, it changed my perspective of it. it's a comedy, but like the conversations they had, um, it changed my perspective of what it is to be woke, but there's so many things you can be woke about. There's race mm-hmm. issues. There's um, LGBTQ community. There's, you know, I mean, social, any social agenda, there's, there's this, are we woke about it? Are we, you know, and it seems, and, and maybe I'm wrong. It seems to be a white person thing. Like it really does seem to be like, yeah, it does. It's a, it's a, it's a white middle class, whatever upper middle class, upper I middle think. class kind of thing. So, and like I think, like Penny said, like you have to be real clear on what you mean by woke. And I think that like some of the people that claim to be woke, I'm like, I don't know if you really are. And then I don't. It, it's it's interesting. It's an interesting conversation for sure. Um, I think it's interesting that this college. I read the article that they took that stance. I think anytime a college, a, anytime Christians put together a task force of any kind to investigate something, like it ain't a task force, but that's basically what they put together. Right. Like we're headed down a, a, a bad, a bad place usually. Yeah. So. What about you, Paul? What do you think about wokeness? Do we have like a eggshell sound effect for walking when we're? Uh, about we have this. <laughs> uh, does that work? <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty subtle. Uh, I think Jeremy's point about it being like a white middle class thing seems to really put it in perspective because. It seems like it's one of those things where it's how, and I mean, we're white middle class in here, how we treat people who are not, how we treat black people or gay people or poor people, and we treat them the opposite, usually of the way the Bible would say treat them. You but, know that because you read the Bible a lot. Well, I mean, I've heard on podcasts, <laughs> yeah. you know, about how <laughs> Once we treat every people. Three so, months. You know, yeah. I mean, but that seems to be that, you know, it's just that word, instead of saying it's progressive, you're woke because it sounds more... Sure. Does it sound more ethnic? And it's a way to say, oh, this is a... Well, and I think that's a good point is are people... the Just, I hate saying the word woke. Are people woke word. because they want to be woke or are they woke because they actually want to try to understand the issue? Sure. Does that make sense? And are they being woke because culturally that's what you have to be now? Because if you're not quote unquote woke, then now you're a bigot or you are racist or you're homophobic or you are whatever thing they want to put you in. So you have like, you're almost allowing society to divine these things for you. And then you have to fit into these categories. And it just, it just seems, you know, I want to be aware and I want to try to understand the pain that people are going through and have been through. 
And to be honest with you, there's certain things that I'm not going to understand because I am a white middle class. I mean, I've had a pretty good life. Like there hasn't been a lot of tragedy um, in my life, you know, as far as like persecution or things happening to me because of this, you know, the systems around me or whatever. But I don't know. I, I just, I wrestle with it. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Penny? What do you think? Jeremy's woke down there. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I hate this word. Um, I, I'm not even sure we even still use this quite a bit. It was really popular a while back. And now it's just a form of saying our eyes are open, right? We're woke to the fact that racial injustice is happening around us. And it's a way to define people who are openly um, standing against, right? Things that are happening in, in the society towards racial issues. So in this particular case, um, I think that's what they're trying to say is I, I don't think they're wanting to, I'm not defending what they're doing. I'm just saying, I, I understand that they're probably not wanting to make a, like a big idea or have people protest and stuff like that. So in defense of the church or whatever Christian school that it is, is probably what's happening. I don't think they're racist. They're probably just trying to settle something before it becomes out of hand. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is that depending on what side of the the aisle you're on, um, culturally, socially, politically, woke can either be a pejorative, like, oh, you're you're woke, huh? Like like a negative thing, or it's a it's a positive thing. And it, it's it's so interesting to me. Um, I do think that it's one of those things that has become a catch-all term for I disagree with your stance on this touchy issue. So I'm going to claim that you're woke or that this is CRT. And I, I, I think that most people probably don't even, they can't define critical race theory. I think the well, vast and I think that's what's interesting can. about when I read this was it seems like, so when they brought the guy in and I need to listen, cause I can't make too many judgments without listening to what he actually said. But when they brought him in, it seemed like a good thing. And it seems like the response, not necessarily of the people that were there, but what they're concerned about, what outsiders think. Does that make sense? And so that seems to be the issue, I think, with a lot of this stuff is, and it goes back to my point, a lot of people are woke because they're worried what other people will think if they're not or the, what their position is. And it sounds like from this article that it sounds like the college was more concerned about what the other colleges or other, the parents of the students or whatever, were going to think about bringing this guy in less than actually what he actually said. Does that yeah. make sense? And I think well, that becomes an even bigger issue is it wasn't what he said or what your viewpoint is on critical race theory. It was you're worried about what the outsider's perspective is going to be. Yeah. Well, so he, he actually, he didn't say anything that you could with an honest and open dialogue say, oh, well, this is related to wokeness or critical race theory right. or even, even like critical race theory, uh, adjacent. I mean, it's, it's just not, it, 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 nothing he says there is, it can be construed that way. Um, it wasn't really until after this, this speaking engagement where Jamar Tisby became a little more outspoken about some, some political policies that are regarding, uh, immigration and voting reform and things like that, that this became a bigger issue. But I do think you're right. And I have to, the, the cynic in me has to wonder how much of this was a financial decision because Christian colleges in general are, I mean, colleges in general are seeing a, a decline, but Christian colleges, especially that don't receive federal funding and state funding and things like that. Uh, I mean, my, my alma mater closed its doors last year. And so I think they're part of, and part of that was, there was a, a, a contingent of donors who felt like, well, the school has lost its way. It's becoming a bastion of Christian liberalism, and so we're going to stop supporting it. So, what, is, what is Grove City's denominational background? Uh, I didn't well, see it in the article. Historically, they were pres Presbyterian, but okay. they're uh, unaffiliated. Mm -hmm. okay. So I will confess, I have no idea what CRT is. And that is a personal reason of why Jeremy just looked at me like, you have no idea because you're, you're does, a previous Penny. educator. No, listen, there's a reason why I made a decision not to read any articles about CRT or to find out what exactly it is because they pushed so hard on educators. Like, don't teach. You're not teaching CRT. And I'm like, I, I, I wasn't. Or not that I knew I, that I was, I was teaching it in my classroom. And at that point, I made, I made a decision I'm not going to read about it. I'm not going to find out what it is because I don't want to change who I am in the classroom and loving people around me or other people when we need to teach our children about things that are happening within our society. And maybe 
that's what's happened to this university too, is that maybe they shouldn't have known anything about CRT and just gone on loving people as a Christian university should be, which is how are we, how are we being more like Jesus? Well, and I think that is, and I'm not picking on you for not, cause I think that's actually a good perspective. If it's just like, maybe stay out, I mean, stay out of it. But I think the, what Rusty's saying about CRT and we're probably going to get in trouble because people hate when we talk, anybody talks about CRT <laughs> um, is there are so many people that don't know what it is that they accuse thing. Does it make sense? Like they're like, Oh, you're talking about this. Well, no, they're actually not talking about that at all. They're talking about something else, but because people haven't taken the time to actually see what CRT or the, and really CRT is, can be loosely defined. There's even people within the CRT camp that have completely different opposing views about the overarching idea. Does that make sense? And mm-hmm. so that's where it gets kind of funky. And, and like I said, I've read several papers about it, trying to understand it, not because I want to affirm it or deny it. It's more like, I just know this was a big controversial issue and I wanted to educate myself before I had any opinion about it, you know, and I got even got confused in a lot of the stuff I was reading and listening to. Yeah. So, so uh, the, this is from Wikipedia's definition, just which, you know, take it for a grain of salt. But Wikipedia, they've actually done studies that are pretty accurate on most things. Uh, CRT, critical race theory, is a cross-disciplinary intellectual and social movement of civil rights scholars and activists who seek to examine the intersection of race, society, and law in the United States and to challenge mainstream American liberal approaches to racial justice. So that's the quote unquote <laughs> definition, if that makes any more no, sense to you. I think I got about 3% of that okay, in. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> it's just, a, it's just a lot. It is. It is a lot. And, uh, I think, um, I, I think that we aren't going to solve it in our podcast. But can we stop using the word woke? That's that's what I'm I thinking agree. about. This. Can we just stop saying things are well, woke? Well, what are we going to replace it with? We're just not. Oh. Well, can we use, you're a Marxist? Yeah. Because that's what people have been. They, <laughs> or witch, you're a witch. You're a, can we I go like back that. to that? Can we yeah. go back to your? Let's go back to witch. Yeah. Um, that's it. The, no longer use you're woke. You're just a witch. But then the de- the connotation is that if you're woke that if, slash witch, then you're a bad person. And God doesn't love you. And I think too, the thing with the wokeness is like you can be woke on certain things, but then not on other things. But then are you not woke because you're only woke? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just a silly thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. It's one more way of splitting hairs and putting people into camps of thought, which we shouldn't do. Okay, well, we solved it. There it is. Uh, so we're going to ask Jeremy what he thinks about uh, about essentials today. And if you don't know what I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna fill you in. So there's this popular adage in a lot of churches, um, about belief, which is this, this, you know, pithy little phrase in essentials, unity in non-essentials liberty and in all things charity. So uh, essentially, um, the things that are non-negotiable, we have to agree the things that aren't, uh, that aren't non-negotiable or the things that are negotiable, uh, we can disagree on that's fine, but in all things we have to be loving. Um, but the the problem lies in talking about what are the essentials, um, because sometimes we don't agree on what the essentials are, or some people think that just about everything is an essential. So we're going to find out what, about the essentials. Yeah, I think it's an interesting conversation. So me and you went from the same kind of historical uh, restoration uh, church college and so that was one of the big things is restoration. We're, we're non-denominational denomination is essentially all way I tell people is we're non-denominational, but non-denominational is becoming domination. So we have our own series of colleges, which me and Rusty both went to one of those colleges. Um, and so the way I was taught it was very similar is an essentials unity and opinions, liberty, and all things love, which is a great idea. Like, so if there's essentials, we should be unified on them. If there's opinions, that means we can disagree, but we can still be friends. But if we agree or disagree in all things love. The problem was when I was taught that my professor then went on to basically make everything an essential. Does that make sense? And so it was like, like I'm sitting in the class and I'm going, okay, I don't know if that is an essential. Um, I might be the worst person to ask about when it comes to essentials, especially if you've ever listened to me, first of all, or taken any of the classes that I teach. Um, I don't know how many essentials there really are. And I have people, in fact, I even in my, what is the Bible class, you know, I talk about like, I just don't debate people anymore. I don't think it's fun. I don't have time to do it. Like you can disagree with me. You can believe that that's fine. Um, you know, and, and so the only essential that I personally see in scripture. So when I say this is what you have to believe to kind of find yourself under the camp of Christianity or following a Christ, 
and I actually stole it from Paul. Um, and it comes in first Corinthians two, two, for he says, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so the reason I like that verse is Paul, who's probably the greatest knower of things when it comes to God, Jesus, all of those things. He's saying when he goes to these people, the only thing that he chose to teach them and to, at the moment, the essential thing they had to understand was who Jesus Christ was and him crucified. And so for me, that's kind of the line is that Christ crucified. So what I mean by Christ crucified? Well, Christ is a title, not a last name. In case you didn't know that, it wasn't Jesus. You know, I am Mr. Christ. Um, you know, that but was his, a, his middle <laughs> initial is H. Jesus H. Christ. <laughs> I love that podcast too. Uh, anyway, um, if you don't know if that, that's well, Rob casted that. I don't know if you got that from. Or yeah, not, but yeah. Um, and so, uh, so, so I say that. I say so when I say the, de- I say I think the deity of Christ, like believing that he was in some ways divine and that he's crucified on the cross. He's a real person that actually lived. That he dies. And then he's resurrected. If you can get in line with that, that's the essential for me. Um, so then everything else, there are other core beliefs that I think we should have. And there are things that I think we should hold tightly onto, but I don't know if they're essential. Does that make sense? Um, and so I know some people will have pushed back on that, depending especially on what type of theological or doctrinal background you grew up on. But when you say the word essential, that's what I focus on. This is the one thing we can't disagree on. Um, there are other things that I do think we should hold tightly to. Um, and there are things that we should have better understandings of to be a good Christ follower and to be a Christian. Um, but I don't know, and I hate this verbiage, but this is the word, but I don't know if they're tests of fellowship. Does that make sense? I don't know if there's things, and that's basically saying the way of saying, I don't know if that means that we can't partner with these churches or, you know, like, and I get in trouble for this because people don't agree with me. Like, I think Catholics are still Christians. Like I know in the grander scheme of things, there's Catholics and Protestants. Well, most Catholics believe Christ crucified and that he raised from the dead. So, you know, we live in this world where people are like, well, Catholics aren't Christian. Well, yes, they are. Like, they really are. Like, so in, in my opinion, again, um, so that's that. And then the other thing I would say about it is these essential teachings. Um, what I find most common, especially in the New Testament, the essential teachings of Jesus seem to be a whole lot more about what you do rather than what you believe. Does that make sense? And I don't mean behavior modification so much as what you do with this gift of life you've been given. And so when I think about the essentials of the Christian faith, first of all, it's Christ crucified. Because here's the thing, and we talk about this, and Paul talks about this extensively in 1 Corinthians. You know, the very opening statement about what is the Bible class, and I stole it from Andy Stanley, but it is a true statement, and he stole it from somebody else, was the foundation of our faith is not the Bible, it's an event. If Jesus doesn't die and resurrected, we don't care what the Bible says, because it's just another Eastern religion that came and went. But we focus on this event. And then once we believe that this event happened, that Christ was crucified and then he raised from the dead and that he was divine and that there's implications not only for us, but for all of mankind throughout human history, then that opens the conversation to everything else that he said and did. And when you study the things that he said and did, he seems to be way more focused on what we do, primarily what we do for others to make this world a better place than he ever does talk about what we actually believe. Does that make sense? And so for me, the essential teachings of Jesus is once we believe Christ crucified and raised from the dead, then if we want to get into essentials, for me, that becomes way more about what we do with this gift we've been given and a whole lot less maybe about some of the specific beliefs that we have about that. Sure. So that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of my thing in a nutshell. So any responses to that or thoughts oh. or I mean, questions? It sounds like as long as we believe that <clears throat> Christ was born and died for us. We don't have to read our Bible as much, so it's okay. That yeah, we, that's what I got. That's what I took. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Because I think that, I think that to me, so, and this is opinion, my understanding of Jesus is I tend to, I used to not, I tend to focus a lot more on the human side of him than the divine. Now I do believe that there's divine nature in Jesus that you're know, fully God and fully human. We want to focus a lot on the fully God and not the fully human. But I actually think that Jesus taught us like what it means to be human. Does that make sense? Like this is what we were designed to do. And so we look at what he does as such an outlier, but in reality, maybe this is the way we were supposed to be living all along. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like I actually do believe in this is, if we actually did what Jesus says, the world would be a better place and probably perfect. You know what I'm saying? Because his focus was always on the outs, the other. And so if you have a whole civilization, a whole world of people that are always focusing on what do I do for the other? How do I give for the other? And not so much just about what I get out of this. I mean, think about it. Like you would have all these people that are going out of their way to make sure that everybody's taken care of and everybody's needs are met and all that stuff. 
So when I say, yeah, you know, you can just believe Jesus not to read the Bible. Like, I think there's so much that we miss on what Jesus said, not only from the divine side, but also from the human side of it. That does that make sense. And so I think it's important to understand that. And I don't think the story starts in, you know, one of the things I believe about the Bible um, is, and this doesn't have to be essentially going to lose, is if you read the Bible starting in the beginning and you go through it, to me, it's a progression. It's a progression of our understanding of who we are as human beings, but also our understanding of God. And so like in the Old Testament, you see a progression, you see a very primitive understanding of God and humanity in the early books. And as you get closer and closer and closer to the New Testament, um, specifically the story of Jesus, you see a progression in human thought and understanding, even within Judaism. Does that make sense? And so I think the Bible is teaching us, and we're getting off of the essentials, but I think the Bible is teaching us who we are. I think it's our human history. And so that's why I think it's important because I think that we can't know what we're going to do in the future if we don't understand our past. And I think the Bible gives us a really good um, indication of where we come from as human beings, not just as faith believers, um, but as human beings. And so that's why I think there's importance of reading it. Now, essentially, do you have to believe that? No, but you know, I think that that's why the Bible, and it goes back to our previous thing. I think people misunderstand the Bible and that's why they get bored with it because they don't understand what it's actually trying to teach us and do. So. So I'm curious, not try to get you in trouble or, or anything. But I get in trouble all the time. It's okay. I know. Well, I don't want you to say something that's going to tick somebody off, but I'm actually curious, um, is there an essential that you feel like people feel like is an essential, but is is not? like? It? Yeah, there's a lot of them. Okay. Um, name a few. I'm curious. So, you know, I, I mean, my, my perception, my understanding of the Bible is probably different than a lot of people's. Um, and so, I mean, you can take the class and learn out. I don't, I don't like to make public statements about it, but it went to, I, so it's all these things to me. So go back to earlier where I said, I don't debate people, but I think it's all a conversation. Does that make sense? And that's the big thing of understanding the Bible is, and even Jesus, I'll talk about this a lot, was when Jesus teaches an idea, like even like it, it's that whole idea of questions and answers. Well, what do you think this means? What do you think about this? And so for me, this is just a conversation. Um, so my understanding of the Bible, and I mean, I'm pretty open about it in the class. I mean, that's, that's my understanding of it is different than a lot of people. Here's what's crazy. My understanding of the Bible is not new. And I would even argue isn't even in the minority. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's a lot of people now where we live specifically, and I don't want to pick on any certain groups of people, but where we live in the Bible belt, um, there's a lot more essentials being taught than are actually essential. Does that make sense? And so that would be one thing. Um, I mean, I grew up in a, in a belief system, you know, the restoration churches, if you weren't baptized, you know, in certain churches, you weren't Christians. I mean, that's what I was taught. Right. And now I'm like, that's ludicrous. Like, that's just insane. Like, you know, I was taught, you know, I mean, there are churches that, you know, essential is you have to tithe 10%, you know, that type of thing. Um, essentials of, you know, and then there's all these like test of fellowship, you know. Um, well, I, I think a, I think a, a really good example of something that has become essential is, and this ties in with how you read the Bible too, uh, reading the Bible, quote unquote, literally. Yeah. Right? And this idea- I was trying like, to avoid that, but yeah, yeah. inherent, <laughs> inerrant or literal. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, look, look at the creation museum, look at, look at the, the, the ark up there, up in mm -hmm. Northern Kentucky or whatever. Like the whole idea is, and this, Ken Ham says this, the, the, crazy leader of that stuff. Um, he says that like, if you don't believe that the earth was created in six literal days, then you are crumbling the whole foundation of all of scripture. Yeah. And so you, according to him and people that agree with him, uh, you have to read the Bible in this way because otherwise it all falls apart and therefore you're not a Christian. Does that make sense? No, I agree. Yeah, yeah I and agree. I, think, I mean, that's a great, so I mean, creation was one of the ones, but that's one of the big ones for me is that I do believe that God created the world and set things into order and still holds and sustains all things. The process by which he did it, I don't necessarily hold the view that has been historically the view that we get from scripture. And I don't, here's the other thing, and this is the thing, I don't think that was what scripture's intentions were. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I think that comes to that understanding. And I don't want to get into like sola scriptura, but that's kind of what all of that stuff comes from is, is that type of thinking. Um, so that was would be, yeah. And there's a lot of them. I mean, that, that, that's a big one right there is your view on scripture, your view on creation. Um, and I'm just not sure that those are the ones that have to be tested fellowship, but there's a whole lot more. I mean, there's a lot of women's roles in the church. There's um, communion. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's churches that, you know, communion is a big deal. I mean, so 
It's just, it's, there's a lot. Oh, this is a really interesting subject. Yeah. yeah. We can do a deep dive into this one day of all the things that are actually not essential and just pretty much, you know, make everybody mad at us. <laughs> well, and I think, I, I think one of the things I always tell people too, when it comes to most people's faith, this is reality. Somebody said something at the time it was a really good idea. And then somebody else said it and somebody else said it and somebody else said it and somebody. And so like now you've got generations of this is what we do. This is what we mm-hmm. believe. And then you're like, well, where did that come from? And people assume it came from the Bible or assume it came from like the church fathers, you know, early on or the disciples or whatever. And then you find out like, no, none of that's even in the Bible. Well, the none rapture is yeah. a great example. Of yeah, that. the rapture. I mean, which if you're coming to my revelation class starting yeah. this Sunday, we're going to cover that. I will be there. I mean, I, w- I would bet. I mean, so people, I don't want to give them too much away. I would bet everybody taking your class, $100, where's the word rapture even used in the Bible? And I guarantee you every single one of them would say the book of Revelation. Yep. And they'd be wrong, yep. you know? And it's just like, there's not even a mention of that in there. And even when we don't have to get into all this, but even rapture mentioned in other, it's not what you think it is at all. Well, and the so, word doesn't even appear in the, in, in the Greek. It's not until, well, we'll get into that. Yeah, later. we'll get into that if you take the class. You just yep. take the class. But yep. I think there's just so many things that we've made essential and then you get like in the real crazy stuff. Like, I mean, like, you know, our traditional background, I mean, people don't know this, we're church of Christ, Christian church. Um, there are churches that if you have instruments on the stage, right. And you're not right. using your acapella voice, like you're not a Christian. And that's not like a suggestion that's essential to them. That's where my wife grew up. She yeah. was very. And so, I mean, there's, mm. there's some crazy ones out there, you know, and there's some bigger ones like creation and your view of scripture. So what is it? Solo scripture. Solo scripture. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, so, and if people want to talk about stuff, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm not going to debate you about it, but, yeah. So, we do, we, we as a church don't have position papers then? <laughs> no, we don't. Oh, no, I mean, and that's, the, that's been the beauty of Journey is, like, we have people from all different backgrounds. Yeah. I mean, there there's not a denominational background that isn't covered here, and, or even most of our people didn't even grow up in church. So, I mean, there, it's, it's, it's way, yeah. It's interesting to me that all these things that you talked about seem to be, like, hot button issues within like church culture where people would, you know, break up and fight and leave churches. And well, that's just why be- there's a, a thousand churches within every square mile. It but it's like. all about love, like, you know, being loved by Christ and being part of the fellowship. But it's like, well, you believe one thing different than I'm, I don't know. It's like, that's, that's how things like woke and stuff get people separated of this many things that you just mentioned. Every single thing in that, yeah. that you mentioned in, about the church would break people apart. So are we woke? Nothing. We're, we're a woke, woke church. We're woke. I am. <laughs> yeah, we're, no, I think it's up for opinion. But I think that's a good point, Paul. I think that that, is, that goes back to what I said. When I study Jesus, my understanding of him is he was way more concerned about what you do than what you believe. Now, what your belief matters and believing in him and the, who he is matters. But then all of the other stuff, we get so focused on beliefs and not focused on what we do. You know, and I think then the world looks at us and they're like, you guys are dumb. Like, mm-hmm. you're breaking up over this. You're fighting over this. Like... Most of the things, and I would argue this, and Rusty, you can agree or disagree. Most of the books that me and you read that find interesting, most of the church and most of the world could care less about those things. Oh, yeah. I mean, we find it fascinating just for studying, but like most people could care less about these issues. We get like hyper focused and makes them test a fellowship. We go to conferences and the speakers talk about these things. Most people could care less. And it's like, you know, and that's, I think, is the sad thing, the state of the church today. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, most people want to know that, that, they are loved, you know, by, by God and by other people. And they want to do their best to love God and love other people. And I think a lot of the other stuff, well, in, in fact, they're one of my favorite, uh, little stories is, uh, there are these two rabbis, you know, Hillel and Shammai and, and, uh, Jesus actually fell in line more with the, the teachings of this rabbi Hillel, but they had this contest about who could say the entirety of the law in the fewest amount of words. And Shammai gets up there and he says quite a few words. And Hillel, he says, well, I can do the whole thing with standing on one foot. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else is commentary on those two things. And he won the contest. And everybody's like, oh, burn. Uh, Shame I lost. But, um, but well, Jesus says the same thing. He says yeah. the entire law can be summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's it's. I think that's it for a lot of people. And I, I don't know that that doesn't need to be it. Uh, so anyways, that was, and as always, we are now smarter because we know. Uh, so let's talk about what's happening here at Journey. We got a lot going on uh, as we are approaching the summer. 
parents, camp registration is open. You can register at whitemillschristiancamp.com for K through eight. I didn't think they have like buddy camp, which is just like for really little kids. It's like day camp and stuff. Yeah, yeah so, there, so there's all kinds of stuff you can register. Uh, if you're interested to know what weeks we recommend, you can find that stuff on the Journey app. Um, the Journey app is also where if you have a kid in high school that would like to go to beach camp, you can register for that there. The cost... Uh, it was three fifty, but but we reduced it down to to two ninety nine. That is a bargain. Why That's a we, great deal. It's it a, is. It's a great week. Um, I'll be there. Me and my wife will be there. It's a week at the camp, or not the camp, the beach. It is a beach camp, but it's a week at the beach uh, with your friends and the camp. I haven't been it, but I've been looking at pictures of it. It's pretty cool. Like it's right on the beach and it is nice. It looks I've, like I've been there several times, and yeah. I I love that place. It's a whole lot of fun. Um, it is on the strip, but way down. So, uh, so it's actually before you get into Panama city. So yeah. you get kind of the, the luxury of not having to deal with all the traffic. Yeah. So go to beach camp. It's a lot of fun. Uh, well, we already mentioned it once, but we're going to mention it again. Uh, the, what is revelation class that begins this Sunday, May 1st, uh, that will be at 6 PM. Um, I've had a lot of people, we've, we've got like 45 people signed up for that. So, um, still some spots available. Um, we're going to try and cap it at 50 just so that, that we're not overdoing it and people have time to ask questions and things like that. Uh, parents for fourth and fifth graders, we've got an event coming up on May 13th. Uh, we're going to take the, the kids to activate up in Louisville, which is, uh, this, this really cool game place with all these like crazy lights and, and stuff. So if you want to register for that, do that on the app. Uh, and for everything else, download the app because there, there is a lot going on and we will continue to keep you in the loop about what is happening, what is coming up and all kinds of exciting opportunities for you to get involved. Okay. So we're going to do something that we haven't done, uh, since December, which is we are going to just give our quarterly recommendations for, uh, what we're watching, what we're reading, what we're listening to, uh, that we think people would enjoy or benefit from. And so, uh, I'll go first just because, um, I, I want everybody else to have a chance to, if you haven't really thought about it yet, which you should have shame on you. So I, I, I'm like always reading two or three books, uh, kind of at the same time, which isn't always productive, but, um, I've been going through, uh, three and, and I finished two of the three and they're excellent. And, uh, the first one, um, is, is it's called everything is spiritual by Rob Bell and Rob Bell gets a really bad rap. Um, he, he, based on this book, he is still very much, uh, according to what we said about the essentials, still very much, uh, a, a Christian. And a lot of people think that because he wrote a book that, insinu <clears throat> excuse me, insinuated that hell wasn't real, that he's no longer a Christian, but I would challenge you to go read everything is spiritual, or you can listen to it on the hoopla app from your local library. That has been like the greatest thing I've discovered recently. Uh, another great book is called Red Skies, 10 Essential Conversations Exploring Our Future as the Church. It's a collection of essays by, um, by a lot of different uh, well-known Christian writers. And it's essentially based on the idea of like that adage, you know, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailor take warning type thing. And what red skies are we seeing as the church. And uh, it's, it's just a really, really interesting um, collection of essays that I highly recommend. There's actually a podcast that they're doing to coincide with it. So you can read the chapter and then listen to a conversation about that chapter. And then the last book I'm reading in this one, I it's, it is so good. And uh, my wife is getting annoyed with me because she'll be trying to fall asleep and I'll be like, Hey, let me read this line to you. Let me, let me read this to you. And it's called when everything is on fire by Brian Zand. And, uh, it's, you know, deconstruction has been something we've been talking a lot about and a lot of Christians have been talking about it, but this book is all about when the world around you, when your faith in God and in humanity and all that, when all of that is on fire, like what do you do? Where do you go? How do you, how do you move through that? And it is so good. Um, Brian Zand is, he's got a really cool story. So he was one of these, uh, super, fundamentalist guys. And then like 25 years ago, he just kind of had an epiphany and he's, he's very like mystic. I don't know if that makes sense to, so, um, but really, really encourage everybody to go read that book when everything is on fire. Also on the hoopla app. So you don't have to pay. You can just read it for free. Uh, I'm listening to a podcast right now that I'm a big SNL fan and, uh, 
there's this podcast called Fly on the Wall that is David Spade and Dana Carvey, and they nice. inter- they interview all these people from the SNL years, and it is very very funny. Um, you get to hear a lot of a lot of inside baseball about SNL, but also you know they'll do characters and stuff like that. So that that's a lot of fun. Uh, and then I'm watching a whole bunch of stuff right now, but the only thing I think I would recommend right now is I'm I'm in season five of Better Call Saul. Season so six. Good. It is so good. It is such a good show. Uh, Better Call Saul is the prequel to Breaking Bad. Um, if if that's something you are interested in. But uh, season six is out now. Season five just came out on Netflix and I'm catching up. And it is just so good. And the the way, like the way they portray the main character, Saul Goodman, he is just a complex character. And it it is it, it is a really interesting case study in a good person who's trying to be good and trying to do good, but just seem, they just can't, they just can't be good. So I don't know. Those are my recommendations. Uh, who wants to go next? Anybody in particular? Does everybody got one? Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Jeremy. You go ahead. <laughs> I have right. a long one. Oh, do you? I mean, no, well, he had a whole bunch of books. I'm actually yeah. just finished one. I finished Bob Goff's Undistracted. Um, it was pretty good for those of you who, read spiritual books, but need something a little bit more lighthearted. Bob Goff is one of those writers. Um, The purpose of the book is really just about we're living in a distracted world. And sometimes we miss what our purpose actually is. And what I love about how he writes is that he plants seeds, you know, so that he's not telling you how to fix things. He's just telling you stories. And hopefully you see yourself in those stories and how that, that will help you. So that was good. Um, I'm not reading anything else at the moment. I'm kind of waiting on Andy Stanley's book coming out. And then TV shows, um, Outer Range on Prime. Have you all heard that? I have heard I watched it. the first episode. I it's haven't, so yeah. weird. It's so good. I like it. It's yeah. totally up my alley. If you like Lost, it's one of those really cool shows. Um, I think that it'll be a good one to keep going. Hopefully it doesn't get too weird because the first one, the first Yeah, I watched the first episode. Yeah. It was good. The first episode was really good. Yeah, you need to keep watching it because it's... It gets even weirder. Anyway, so that uh, I did start, for those of you who liked the Vikings TV show when it went off, the um, they did they made another one for Netflix called Vikings Valhalla. And I just started watching that and it's really good too. It's like a hundred years later. So there's new characters, but still the same concept. So still a really good show. Uh, podcast. I will mention the Bible Project one more time. Uh, it's Tim Mackey, right? Jeremy mm-hmm. Tim Mackey, yeah. He's fantastic. He breaks down the Old Testament a lot into stories and really gives you a better perspective of what it probably was actually happening at that time. So for those of you who had mentioned, maybe I read the Bible to like a literal sense, this would be the podcast for you. Yeah, he's so. a super smart guy and he's young. Um, so he explains things like on in language that people can understand, like our age and stuff. But anybody could understand. But I love Tim Mackey a lot. Yeah, fantastic yep. way to listen to the Bible. So cool. Yep. Very good. Paul, you got anything? I, um, <clears throat> in this last quarter, I can't say that I've actually read any books, which is shameful. But before that, I had uh, borrowed a book from Jeremy, the John A. Cuff. Oh, yeah. Is it Do Over? that I Yeah, Do Over. And then I read his next book, Start, which was very good. And I remember when we started the church, you had us all read Stuff Christians Like. That was one of my favorite books. I yeah. love that book. That's a good book. Anything John A. Cuff has written has really just been gold and can yeah. be highly recommended. Um I made it the six weeks from the theater to HBO to watch the Batman for free. Mm -hmm. I'd say I could recommend most of that. It's pretty long. Yeah. It's, you know, it's Batman. I haven't watched it yet. It was good. Oh, it's so good. I'm going to. It's three hours, but I mean, yeah. You know, it's a very different take on Batman, I would say. But like, but actually, like Rusty was playing, probably more true to the true to the detective novels or whatever. Yep. yep. I don't get in all the lore. I just watch the movies. I'm a big nerd. Yeah. I do like the fact that it was almost like Batman meets like Kurt Cobain ish kind of like it was like kind of like a grunt. I don't know. It's some Nirvana. Grunge Batman. It really was kind of like a grunge Batman. Like it really was like a grunge Batman. And actually, yeah, there was Nirvana song. That was a great song. It it worked. I was not into Nirvana when they were popular. I was alive and it was very big, but I was very much raised in a country household, but Nirvana is very good. What's funny is, uh, (laughs) I mean, that's, it took me 40 years, but Nirvana is very good. So when that movie came out, uh, Nirvana's streaming revenue increased by like 400% because Mm -hmm. everybody was like, oh, what's this song? It's retro now. That's right. I don't know if I'd ever heard that until then. I'm like, this song is amazing. It's perfect for this movie. And they go, oh, it's 30 years old. Yeah. So um, I've been trying to get into Moon Knight on Disney Plus and. The first two episodes are great. The third, I'm not real sure what's going on anymore, but I'm going to stick it out. 
but mostly uh if you want you know you talked about the hoopla app the if you if you want free tv the pluto tv pluto.tv free stuff on there i've been watching a lot of the price is right the bob barker years there's a whole channel oh, nice. of 24 hours a day 1980s uh prices right and it's it's a bizarre place that we used to be in as a country, as a TV yeah. shows and game shows of how it used to be. So, yep. and that SNL podcast is great. That I love you, it. You brought it up to me, and the, you mentioned Conan before to me, and turned me on to that too. Conan also has a great podcast. I so love I Conan. Conan He's O'Brien so funny. needs a friend. Oh, it's 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 on. I listen to it every Monday. It's the first thing I do. Yeah, even before reading the Bible. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Rusty. All right, Jeremy. You're All up. right. So podcasts, uh, we'll start with books. I will start with books. So Red Sky in the Morning, Rusty recommended me. I read it in two days. It, yeah. was, it was really good. I'm a um, I just put down, just finished uh, Think Again by Adam Grant. If you never said it, Adam Grant, he's a researcher, psychological researcher. But it's the whole book's called Think Again. And it's basically the way to teach yourself to challenge everything you've ever believed. Because that's like, even like what we talked about today, people immediately have pushback and their pushback is, well, I've always believed this and somebody's telling me something different. So it's a really good book of a way to try to train yourself to like be open to ideas and stuff like that. And then uh, this is, the, I just finished uh, Talking to Strangers with Malcolm Gladwell, which has been out for a little while, but it's a really, really good book. And then my my selfish read is, I'm upset, people don't know this about me, but maybe you could have read about it. Uh, my spirit animal is like the American buffalo or bison. And so there's a book by Steve Ranella called The American Buffalo. And I just read that. And so um, so that was really good. But most people would not like that. Uh, podcast, there's so many I'm listening to. Um, but the one I recommend right now is Nateland. It's uh, Nate Bargatze's podcast. It's really, really funny. Where do you um, listen to that? I've only ever seen the on YouTube. Apple. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Well, sorry. It's, not, but it's, it's on, on YouTube. Spotify yeah, and it, Stitcher. It's, a, it's yeah. not on Stitcher. But the Nateland podcast. If, if you don't know Nate Bargatze, he's... So just recommended watching. You should go on Netflix if you have it and watch all of Nate Bergazzi's stand up. He's really, really funny. Uh, he's from Nashville, but he has family here in Louisville, actually. So he has little ties a little Tennessee to kid. It was yeah, good, Tennessee yeah. kid. Um, so yeah, watch Nate Bergazzi. So that's two for one podcast. I'm listening to another podcast, News- Newsworthy with Norsworthy. is always one of my favorites, um, but that's a good one as well. Uh, what I'm watching, I, I've talked about this show. It's so weird, and but I love it. It's Severance. Anybody watch that on Apple TV? Um, it's a really interesting concept, uh, but it's really good. And it's got Adam McKay, I think the guy that was on, um, uh, Parks and Rec. Rec, Yeah. So it's really good. I I started watching Moon Knight because I watch all the Disney stuff. I'm with you. The first couple episodes are really good. I'm not really sure what's going on at this point. Um, and then I, uh, my wife, we have three or four shows we put in rotation. And so they're usually the office, um, 30 rock Parks and Rec and the new girl. And we will sit there and watch it from season one, episode one, all the way through. And so we're on a new girl kick right now. And I know that sounds weird, especially for a guy to talk about it. But it's one of, to me, it's one of the funniest shows I've ever seen. It was written really well. The characters are great. What's her name gets on my nerves. Uh, but Zoe Deschanel. Zoe Deschanel. But the guy characters, Winston specifically. Like Winston, to me, is one of the funniest characters that's ever been created. Uh, so we're on season six of that. And uh, so we're kind of slow playing it because we know there's only one more season. The last season's only like eight episodes. So we're watching that if you never watched that. And then uh, you mentioned The Vikings. So this made me think, I watched The Last Kingdom. Have you ever watched The Last Kingdom? I have not done that. So That's last, on Netflix. Yeah, it's, it's really yeah. good. I got into it a couple years ago and it's really good. It's like an historical... Uh, it's about the Anglo-Saxons and like the, the the Danish and the Anglo-Saxons and basically the start of England and, and part of Europe and all that stuff. But um, it's actually based, I didn't know this, on true stories. And so uh, the main character is made up, but he's kind of, it's almost like Braveheart. He's a combination of several people that were active, uh, but he, but it's actually really, really good. And it's violent. I mean, it's Anglo-Saxons versus the Dane. I mean, expected to be violence and right. stuff, but it was really good. Historically, it's pretty accurate from what I've read actually what happened. So I like it. Yep. Cool. Well, that is going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for listening. Once again, download the Journey app. That will keep you up to date on everything that's going on here. And we hope to see you soon. And we hope that you'll uh, continue to subscribe and rate us. Help us expand our audience. Talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.